Hello again, and welcome to the Vandy Sports Podcast presented by Anchor Impact. Today is the Wednesday Roundtable Show. We are usually joined by Luke White. Luke's out of town. Couldn't make it today. Instead, we get the Bill and Joe Show. How are you guys? Good. I like that Bill and Joe Show. Yeah. yeah I, I like that you're awake this early. I know. That's, that's, <laughs> that's, that's not easy to do around these parts, I hear. Yeah, we Joey. Are, we we're ready to before go. we before we got on. Joey goes, "Man, this is a tough. This is a tough recording time." And I was like, "Yeah, try doing it for basically a whole football season." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, there's, there's that also. It, I, when I was your age, I I could not get up that early very easily either. It, it gets easier as you get older for whatever reason. But in any case, <laughs> uh, lots it. to talk about today. Go ahead, Joey. I'm sorry. I still can't do it. Yeah, this, this is misleading. <laughs> it, it it sucks to get up this early in your 20s I, I remember those days but in any case uh today's show is presented by anchor impact billy tell us more about anchor impact yeah anchor impact is uh of course the commodore collective vanderbilt's collective commodore nation get closer to vanderbilt like never before with anchor impact the official nil collective for vanderbilt gain access to unmatched exclusive coverage and be part of a one-of-a-kind community you can access behind the scenes content exclusive events unique merchandise and personalized experiences creating an unparalleled connection with the student athletes journey you also become a catalyst for change redefining the landscape of college athletics and showcasing the potential impact of nil on student athletes lives help the commodores thrive and contribute now by logging on to anchorimpact.com slash register basketball season coaching searches and all the stuff that's come with the last few years of Andy basketball in the aftermath of it presented by the wash house are you dreading laundry day is it stealing time for the things you truly enjoy let the laundry professionals at the wash house take care of that for you with two convenient locations in the Nashville area drop off your dirty laundry our professional attendants can give you back the one thing you can never have enough of that is your time with the 24 hours pick up your nicely folded fresh clean laundry ready to be put away Check out washhouseclean.com. Stop in today. Get your time back. Steve Andrews, that's his company. Big Vandy fan, good friend of mine. Uh, They do great work. Uh, Just wonderful people. Do it with integrity. Support those who support us. Also, support ice cream. People bring you ice cream as well as baseball. Or Murfreesboro Pure Milk Company a family-owned third-generation milk and ice cream distribution company located in Murfreesboro. A partnership began 50 years ago with Purity Dairy in Nashville to provide Purity Milk and ice cream to consumers in Middle Tennessee. They now serve Southern Kentucky, Northern Alabama, Chattanooga, North Georgia. They supply grocery stores, convenience stores, and others with Purity products, as well as Mayfield, Nestle, haagen ice cream. For more information, visit their website, mpmci.com. Ice cream is what makes the world go around, and I can eat it again. Thank God. We are back in the Lee house. It's back in the Lee house. All right. We got about an hour today. Not even quite that at this point. Got a lot to talk about. We got the convergence of spring football, basketball related stuff, and, and baseball too, as we hit the heart of conference play. Billy, I'll let you pick where we start today. It feels like basketball is maybe still the the overriding topic of interest with the fan base. I could be wrong there, but I'll, I'll let you no, either yeah. start there or somewhere else. Yeah, it does. Joey and I were talking about that yesterday, actually on the phone. We were just talking how it feels like basketball is kind of the talk right now and kind of the buzz, even though you are in the middle of a baseball season. And, you know, the baseball season, they're a top 10 team in the country. It's not like, you know, Team, you know, it's not like fans are locked into the the Byington hire because baseball is struggling. Baseball is still going well, right. but yeah, I, I just think with with Mark Byington, you know, this could have gone, I think, one of two ways. The, the first way this this whole process in this first week and a half or so could have gone for Byington was, okay, he gets hired, you know, says all the right things, uh, basically press conferences the same as it was, but we don't hear a lot of the the extra stuff that we've heard um and and we've we've been able to share a lot of it um i think there's some good mailbag questions on that about maybe getting into specifics about why we you know 
have confidence in him and, and what he can potentially do here. Uh, say we didn't hear though. I mean, because th- there's that, that's a scenario, you know, us not really hearing much else, you know, he's hired, he gets up there, he talks and it's like, okay, you know, but I think we've heard from enough people that he's doing the right things. He's talking to the right people. He, you know, he's smart. He's heady enough. He He's experienced. And I think that's encouraging. Now, again, he hasn't played any games. He hasn't, um, you know, I, I guess he's gotten one, one recruit, uh, one commit from Jalen Carey over at James Madison. And probably, you know, you would guess three, four more. I, I mean, potentially, who knows? But I just think a lot of the ancillary stuff and the extra stuff we've heard from from other people and from a lot of other people, some of us the same people, and a lot of it we have been able to share. Some of it I think fans would be really excited about. But it's just it's just a lot of that for me. It's a lot of the extra stuff that I think is encouraging for fans. And again, for Byington, you know, he's this has been a whirlwind for him, I would I would have to imagine. Um, you know, and be, because he's got mm-hmm. he's got to figure out okay, I want to I want to connect with former players and the alums and the fans, but I also got to get kids into my program. I've got to, yeah. you know, I've got to recruit. I think he'll be at the Final Four this weekend. So, you know, he, he's this is tough for him right now. He knows it's a challenge, but I, I don't think he would have taken it without realizing that. Um, and again, I think a lot of fans are, are wondering who are they getting, right? Who are the portal targets? And I, I joked with Joey about this. It's like, we don't know. Like we we don't we don't have any. <coughs> excuse me. We don't have any staff connects right now. We won't even know who's officially on the staff. So there's a lot of unknowns, but I don't think in a bad way necessarily. Like I think, you know, kind of in the dark. Byington has done a lot, and we've heard a lot about that. So Joey, to me, that's like a lot of the ancillary stuff that we've heard from other people about who he's talking to, um, his style of play. You know, he had a couple of, uh, well, I don't know exactly how many, but he had a- at least one person, one recruit on campus yesterday, we know. So to me, Joey, it's just what we've heard. And I think, again, he hasn't played any games, but that in and of itself gives me some some confidence. I think I think should give fans confidence about what Byington can do here. I think the overwhelming thing that's given me confidence is just kind of the feeling that he gets it. And I think I've felt that a lot throughout the last week and a half and Obviously, they haven't played a game yet. They've got one commit, and it's a guy that he's already had, and I don't think they're going to get another commit from James Madison. But it is interesting. I just I do think he gets it overall. I think he gets where this program's at. I think he gets where the fan base is at. And I think that's probably the biggest thing right now. Obviously, he's got to get a portal class that makes them competitive. And it's interesting because I think Billy and I had talked about it last night as well. They've kept a lot of guys that I'm not sure that we necessarily thought they would keep. And – I think maybe some of those guys could leave, but right now it's going to be more of a similar roster to what they had last year than what I had originally thought. So I'm not expecting them to be a tournament team next year or anything, but it does seem like this program has more of an identity than it's had in the past. And it feels Ooh. like they are starting to kind of get what's going to make this thing successful. And that's what gives me optimism that maybe this could be something that works long term. It's just because they seem to have the blueprint and Clark Lee has the blueprint and it hasn't necessarily worked, but I think the blueprint is a lot easier for Vandy basketball and Mark Byington is starting to realize that it is possible to win here. And it seems like he's taking the right steps to do so thus far, Chris. Yeah, that's, I mean, there, there's a plan there. And I think this time it's, it goes a lot deeper than I, I'm a genius. Just trust me. Um, but I think that he hit the ground running and we've all heard some stuff. It's, it's probably not stuff we, can share. I mean, they're not nuclear secrets or anything. It's just stuff people have told us in confidence here and there. And it's, I'll just put it this way. It's the kind of stuff that if you'd said, all right, they're going to hire a new basketball coach. What should he be doing? What are, what are the, the things that he should be doing? What are those things? He's look doing like? all of it. Yes. He's hit the ground running. He's making relationships. He is, I think maybe trying to repair some relationships, all those sorts of things that have to be done. Look, the the program got set back several years from the previous staff, and I don't know that we're going to be sitting here this time next year talking about Vanderbilt just having made a run to the NCAA tournament. That would surprise me, but it feels like he's getting some traction with some decent players here and there. 
feels like he's got a, a plan to maybe look at the guys on the roster and say, do these guys fit? And sometimes you just never know. We've been in a weird era of college basketball where you get guys fifth and six years, and some of that's going to be coming to a close after next year. But look at North Carolina State. DJ Burns was at Tennessee his freshman year. Didn't play. Red shirted the whole time. Uh, basketball players are sometimes a work in progress. And even though I don't think any of us were big fans of Jerry Stackhouse and his recruiting, th there were some kids that ended up being a little bit better at times than we thought they'd be coming in. You know, maybe he's got a diamond in the rough or two that can be dealt with. But I, I'll say this, I, I trust him on that. I don't, you know, maybe they get in a point where they got around out the roster with 13 scholarship guys and with admissions standards and the state of the program, they can't get the 13 that, that they need on the roster next year without maybe retaining some guys that, that you wouldn't retain other places. But maybe he can make something out of all that. I'm just interested to, to see what it looks like because I feel like for the first time in a while, uh, there's been a cohesive and, and competent approach to it. So, Yeah, so and, and guys, that. You, look at, you look at the teams – in the final four right now, um, those aren't five fabulous freshmen, right? Those, these are there's a lot of older guys, there's a lot of older transfers, and I saw a tweet, and I can't, I can't, I don't have time to go back and find it, but I, it was a really good uh, display of today's kind of era per se of college basketball. The teams that are winning and the teams that are that are moving on, whether it's Sweet Sixteen, Elite Eight, Final Four, National Title. They have older players that have been retained in the program and and understand the system that that coach wants to run. But you also have older transfers, not necessarily, you know, sophomore transfers or got, you know, young transfers that you think could fit down the road. You have immediate impact, older transfers. Um, Joey, we've joked about Cormac Ryan at, at North Carolina. You know, he's got an MBA from from Notre Dame. He's, he's like 25. So I think. And, and again, that 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 type of guy is kind of probably going by the wayside here with COVID years basically being done with, I think, after this season. But you could still get older transfers. I think that I think Byington understands that. And I think that's going to take a while, though, because, again, you can still win with a younger team. But I just think and I think, Joe, you'd agree with this in today's world of college basketball. Look at Tennessee. You know, th th that's a group that has been there forever. Vescovy and Jordan James, I mean, that's why they were in the Elite Eight. They're older players. They've been there. They've done that. They know what they're doing, and they've got a, They got an older transfer like a Dalton Connect. I just think I think that's a blueprint that Vanderbilt and everybody should follow because that, that's what's winning. And we obviously know with with the, you know, the one-and-done type player at, at Kentucky is not working anymore. I mean, that, that has been proven over the last four or five years. So... Um, you know, I just look at that. I think Vanderbilt down the road, if you're buying 10, and again, it's going to take a while. I still think I'm not, and I do want to temper a little bit. You know, we tempered last year before the basketball season, Joey, with um, with a lot of fans. I think you did a better job of that than I did. But I still want to, you know, basically look at the facts here and say, okay, the roster hasn't changed a ton as it sits right now. Um, you do have Jalen Carey, who knows what portal guys they get. It does look like their freshman class will be retained. Um that Stackhouse, of course, recruited. But it's going to take a little bit for, for Byington to get this going. And if you look at his past stops, it took him one to two years, usually around two years. And year three was when he really started to, to get things rolling at his program. But, Joey, I think you would agree here. you you got to be old in, in today's day and age. And Vanderbilt isn't necessarily old, and they haven't really retained players within their program in the last five years. Yeah, Billy, uh, I'm going to go back to the old Mike Bray saying, and get old, stay old. And I don't know that Vanderbilt yeah. either right now, but I think Mark Byington gets that that's what has to be done. And Chris and I talked about on the intro podcast for him that maybe something that we overlooked throughout the hiring process was that he was able to retain guys. And I think that's a big thing for him is that he has been able to retain guys. Terrence Edwards was his best player and stayed for four years. He undoubtedly had offers before that to go in the portal and go elsewhere, but he didn't. And I think it's kind of a double-edged sword right now because their roster was so bad last year. Like they had so many guys who didn't look like capable SEC players. But also I think it is worth noting that Mark Byington has been able to keep the roster together. And obviously they're in the honeymoon phase. He's never yelled at anybody. He's never 
got on anybody at practice or had an argument with anybody. But it is interesting to see kind of the fire he's ignited in this program. There's at least one or two guys on the current roster who I was told would have gone in had Stack still been the coach. And those guys are currently on the roster and don't plan to leave from the looks of it. And I think they got a chance to retain some of the portal guys as well. I think Jason Rivera Torres fits really well with what they want to do if he's able to defend. I think Colin Smith, if they can promise him a role, I think they got a chance to get back as well. And I wouldn't rule out Paul Lewis as well. His brother played for Mark Byington. So it'll be interesting to see what happens there. But again, it is a double-edged sword with the retention because obviously attrition is a good thing when you win nine games and it's the same for football when they won two games. But I do think that there is some value in keeping a guy like Malik Presley or J.Q. Roberts and just kind of seeing what you have, at least for a year. And I do wonder, is Mark Vines going to be a little more patient than Stack was with his roster? He already kind of has been, assuming they keep a lot of these guys and he doesn't push them out in the next week or so. But there's a lot of guys Stack wasn't patient with who had worse results than what Vanderbilt's guys had this year. And if Byington keeps those guys, maybe that's a sign that he is looking to get old and stay old, Chris. Let's talk baseball for a bit before we go to the mailbag. And, and I think maybe we'll hit some football questions in the mailbag. Um, but we, we won't get so much time today. Guys, I'd feel a little bit better. I think if they were maybe seven and two or eight and one headed into LSU this weekend, but but it could be a lot worse. Uh, this has been a topsy turvy SEC where it's hard to win on the road. Uh, you see some strange things happen with matchups. Look, seven weeks in, they probably played, I don't maybe their seven easiest weekends of baseball to this point. I could argue their seven toughest are to come. I think a lot's going to center on pitching. Big, big series with LSU, an LSU team that's struggling. Vanderbilt might have gained a little bit of an advantage by having its midweek game rained out. And LSU had to pitch some guys in a loss to Southern that maybe you would have wanted to have a little more rested for this weekend series, which, by the way, starts Thursday night. Uh, Billy, there's some starts to thought us off with. What what are you thinking on baseball right now? Yeah, it's – man, I, I still struggle to get a read on this group. Um, you yeah. Know, I think after – after the – I'm trying to figure out where – yeah, Houston. After Houston, I mean, they rolled through that. You know, 3-0, really – I don't want to say dominated, but, I mean, they they made they, they made a statement around, around the country, I think, after, you know, beating Texas and coming back from that, Houston and Louisiana. You go 3-0 in Houston, and they really needed that, and they were playing really well. And then they string off a midweek win. They sweep Illinois State. They beat Indiana, then they sweep Auburn at home, and then Joey and I were here. Belmont three to one, kind of shaky. Um, and again, th- those Belmont games are never easy. You know, whether it's Belmont, MTSU, midweek games are are, are usually tough uh, to get through, and then you get swept in pretty lackluster fashion in in, in Columbia. Yeah, um, it's kind of a weird start. You know, they didn't play Friday; they had to play two Saturday, and it just kind of unraveled for them. And and we talked about that. And then Missouri this past weekend just didn't look like the team we saw in Houston. Um, and you're playing Missouri. You know, you're not playing A&M. You know, th- this is a Missouri team that's not good. Um, now, they can pitch okay. Um, but, you know, not scoring five runs in any of those games, you know, and, and you look at it and you score, end up scoring 10 runs only on the whole weekend, there, I, I still think there's some questions. And, and again, it's baseball. You know, we're not even halfway through the season. I, I still think this team is really good. Um, but they, they're they banged up slightly pitching-wise. Um, and then offensively, you know, start to look at some of the numbers, and it's a it's a good offensive team. I mean, you know, there, there's no bones about that and numbers-wise, batting average-wise, but power-wise, that that power aspect, it, it just, just isn't there. And, and that's not news to anybody. Um, but I just think Espinal, he's a guy that has to perform for this offense um, because, he, you know, he's in the middle of the lineup. He's got arguably the most power, I mean, at least so far. You know, there, I mean, you don't look around. Leneve has some power. But other than that, you know, Bolger potentially. Bolger's been in and out of the lineup. You just – the power guys you have, you got to have them perform and you got to have them yeah. at least hitting some home runs because if not, 
you're not you're going to get bulldozed in this SEC. You just are. It's a fact. Um, I mean, look at Georgia, Tennessee over the weekend. Georgia put up 17 runs on Friday. There's probably a total of I don't even know, Chris, 100 <laughs> run score. It felt like in that series. So you you got to put up more runs than Vandy has so far. And it starts this weekend. I mean, you go to an LSU team that's reeling. Yeah. They've got a couple really good starting pitchers, uh, but their bullpen is leaky. And so I think th this this could be a high-scoring affair because we've seen Vanderbilt's bullpen be leaky at times as well. Um, but, Chris, I'm looking this weekend, and, Joe, you'd probably agree, I'm looking <coughs> for this team to not have a, one of those road meltdowns, right? We, we saw it in Columbia with Calvin Hewitt after he dropped that fly ball. I think three runs scored on that, and it just felt like everything crumbled. You know, and and say you're down, Joey. Say you're down in the series 2-0. Can they salvage? Because that's important, right? Avoiding a sweep in the SEC, especially on the road. So I'm looking at that, Joey. Can this team avoid a meltdown? And can they keep the pitching rolling? I mean, they dominated Missouri last weekend. Can they do that against LSU's bats? Or at least, can they do that to an extent? LSU's bats are a lot better than Mizzou's. Uh, but pitching wise, I'm really interested to see what they do, who they put where. Uh, this weekend because it does start tomorrow night um and it's a it, it's a big series chris you're right it, to show that vanderbilt is is a still a top 10 team and, and can can hang with the big boys i think this is with this weekend is big and joey i, I just think they've you got to have more than than the power output they've had also right you talk about that south carolina series that series almost reminded me of one of their football games this year to where you make one mistake and it just builds mm -hmm. on each other over and over again. And that's what that whole series reminded me of that being their one big road series concerns me a little bit. I think this is a big test for them this weekend, just to kind of see what they have. Anybody can do it at home and what they've done at home is really impressive. And there's a reason they're a top 10 team right now, just because of mm -hmm. what they've done at home. They swept all over a ranked team. They completely shut down the zoo all weekend. There's obviously some merit to that, but I think, this is a big weekend for them to go prove it against a team that's really talented. And obviously they've sputtered a little bit, but I think that's a team that if you go in there and you let mental mistakes build on each other and you don't have the starting pitching that you've had at home, you have the starting pitching you had at South Carolina, you're going to have a really tough time getting out of there with one or even two. But I think they're certainly capable of going in there and getting a few. Uh, it's just a matter of what does their chin look like, as Lenny Acuff says? Uh, how resilient yeah. are they? Uh, can they handle being in that environment? Because it seemed like in South Carolina they were a little rattled by that environment and kind of the circumstances around that series. Are they ready to go this weekend? And what do the bats look like, Billy? I think it's a great point. Uh, I think this weekend was, again, a little concerning. The starting pitching was unbelievable. Grayson Carter was fantastic. Bryce Cunningham won SEC Pitcher of the Week. Holton was really good as well. If you can get that, I don't think many teams are beating them, but I don't think you can consistently rely on that, Chris. Yeah. I have some concerns about them because it seems like they've not been a great road team. I'd have to go back and look. My, my memory escapes of some of last year, but I don't know if it's a road thing or if it's a certain type of team that can just bully you with, with the home run. Cause I look back to that last home series of 2022 when they're playing LSU and they just get bombed out of their own mm -hmm. ballpark. And then you go, Last year, what happened in Knoxville? And they just got boat raced in that one. Um, you know, this year, the South Carolina series, they just fell apart. You know, then the field drop and fly ball, stuff like that. Now, sometimes you just have a that's baseball week, and maybe we look back on that, and that's all that was. But I'm starting to get a little concerned about venue and type of team. And you look up ahead on the schedule – you got some teams that could be problematic. You got road trips to LSU and A and M. You got Florida here. That's a team that hits home runs. You got Georgia here. That's a team that hits a lot of home runs. You got Tennessee here. That's a team that hits a lot of home runs. Georgia, Tennessee, number one and two in the country. And you got Kentucky on the road. And I think they match up stylistically pretty Better, well yeah. with Kentucky. Um, they play the same type of ball in Vanderbilt usually because he gets better talent. If you're putting two light teams on the field that can do things the same way, I, I like Vanderbilt's chances. They handled Kentucky last year in a three-game sweep here. But, again, I go back to where I started, 
and it's their seven toughest series, in my opinion, ahead of them potentially. Well, I would I would say I would take that back. I would say at South Carolina would be one of their seven toughest series in there somewhere. So that one's down. But the, the other six, I don't know. I think the ones that, that are ahead are tougher than the ones that are behind. And I'm very interested because they catch an LSU team that is reeling. I, I don't know if that's good or bad. I mean, I, I think it's probably more good than bad. But that's a team that's desperate, too. And given Vanderbilt struggles away from home, or maybe on the road, not away from home. Away from home, they went and went 3-0 and in a neutral spot. So there was that. But I think we all have the same concerns here. Yeah, the SEC is survival mode. I mean, th- th- that's what it is when it comes down to it. Um, now, <laughs> we're not used to seeing Vanderbilt have to be that type of team that has to survive week in, week out. Yeah. Right, Chris? I mean, you've covered this team for over 20 years, ever since Corbin got there. And in the early stages, um, and especially 2010, 11, 2014, and 15, it was Vanderbilt. Florida, LSU, you know, Mississippi State had some good teams, but it wasn't, there wasn't as much parity. I mean, really, one through 13, you know, take yeah. Missouri out of it. Good luck on the road. I mean, that, that's, yeah. that's just kind of what it is. And so that's why I said, if, if you're down 2 0 in the series, you cannot get swept. I thought Vanderbilt did that. Maybe, I know they still got a one seed and they've, I said one seed. I'm in basketball mode. They still hosted a regional, and you know they were fine in the long run last season. But I did think they got swept more times than I think a lot of us are used to, Chris. So yeah, um, I just think that's important, right? You you hang in there and don't just get dominated. Uh, show that okay, this is just a tough atmosphere against a really tough team, tough matchup for us. But I, I'm looking for this team not to be overmatched. And, and not yeah. for us to tune into this and say Vanderbilt has no shot, right? And so I yeah. think that's that's kind of that's kind of what I'm looking for a little bit. I don't think Vandy baseball should ever be overwhelmed, Chris. Well, yeah. no, and it and, and shouldn't. But look, it's guys, it's a different league than even it was five years ago. Everybody's yeah. invested in baseball, save maybe one school, that's Missouri, where they've just been down for so long and – it's never I been. I think they're ball. trying now too. They're trying, and I mean, and, and even yeah. then, they look like, just by virtue of being in the SEC. If you can get a few arms, you can compete with teams on the weekend. Mm-hmm. And then Missouri was competitive against Vanderbilt, even though it didn't win. Just didn't have anything on the offensive side in order to score enough runs to make it tougher. But I, I want to flip back to to Vandy here for a minute, guys. I'm very interested. I don't believe they have at this moment announced a rotation for this weekend. Billy, have I missed that by chance? Uh, no, they haven't yet. Okay. This is what I'm watching for. I think Holton's been really good on Fridays. Um, if you keep him healthy and well, he's he's that Friday night ace that you hoped he could be, it feels like to me. Bryce Cunningham has been a real surprise to me, and and the two I know they believed him in him a long time ago, but I needed to see results. We've seen some results. Now that South Carolina series got tough at times, but I mean, for for every mediocre to bad outing that Bryce Cunningham's had, there's been probably mm-hmm. two to three pretty good ones. Uh, so I, I feel like he can be very much trusted. And you look around, it is an offensive era, guys. Guys are just getting their ears pinned back every time they take the mound with the offense in the in, in college baseball. So they're in really good shape one and two. I've always been a Devin Futrell guy. Really think he's been a little bit underappreciated, but there's also the fact that he is a fly ball guy. And boys, it is an era of, of, of gorilla ball. Um, you get the ball in the air. We're, we're talking launch angles. You, you got some big dudes in this league. And, like, uh, it, at the right weekend, Devin Futrell can be great. We saw it against Illinois State. We've seen it against a bunch of teams throughout his career. But I, I look on that schedule, LSU, A&M, Florida, Georgia, Tennessee. You got some teams that are built around the home run. You know who keeps the ball on the ground and has improved his control, and that's Grayson Carter. I think you, you and, and we don't know what's happening with JD Thompson yet. We hadn't seen him in a bit. There's also David Horn for that matter. Um, 
I'm not sure what the status of David Horn is right now or saw your Hawks for that reason. Uh, but put those guys aside for a minute. I wonder if this is the weekend that you see Grace and Carter in that weekend rotation, because I think you're going to LSU. He does not give up home runs. And that, that might be the switch you want to make, given the way that both he and Futrell have pitched recently. Yeah. Carter, no home runs this season. Futrell has given up six. That's the most on the team. Um, Bryce Cunningham's given up four, which, you know, isn't isn't awful. But I, I think Cunningham, you know, you look at that, maybe he needs to get that down a little bit. Holton, you know, Holton's fine right there. Um, I'd like to say Cunningham is fine in the rotation as well. I think you're right, Chris. Chris, this is probably the weekend where the staff kind of goes. And again, I don't know if they're doing this for sure, but Futrell or Carter, uh, especially matchup yeah. wise, you know, it, it against Kentucky, maybe Futrell's your guy. Um, and that's fine. You know, I mean, it, there's no problem kind of rotating guys. And I think we we had said that before the season that they might end up doing that. So, yeah, it's going to be interesting. And Chris, can Futrell work <laughs> against, you know, can he work against AM and LSU and, and Tennessee? Maybe they test it out this weekend and, and, and see what happens. Um, but I'm with you. Carter's been really good, and I think the, the rest of the league is starting to take notice on him too. I mean, he's yeah. pumping triple digits we've seen. So um, I, that that kind of battle there per se, Carter, Futrell, is going to be interesting to watch. I think they've got a they've got more of a chance against LSU with Carter than Futrell. And I, didn't, I don't know if I thought I would say that in the preseason, but I could see them still starting Futrell just because – He's one of their guys, but I think Carter has certainly earned it. it I'm really interested to see what they do this weekend because it, it almost feels like – I wonder if it's like the Jack Bolger thing where they're going to give him every chance. And Bolger, I think, has done a lot better than people have given him credit for this year, but I wonder if it's that type of thing where they're going to give Futrell another weekend or two. I remember early in the year people were clamoring for Dukanich over Cunningham, and Cunningham has kind of proven that – he's worthy of a weekend spot and Dukanich obviously is out for the year. So we'll see, but I, th I think Carter might be the play here this weekend. Any thoughts on anything else before we get into the mailbag? I think we could probably easily spend 23 minutes on the mailbag and that's, that's how much time Billy's got. So yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm ready for the mailbag. Yeah, I'll let you get your questions ready. I'll do our reads here. The mailbag sponsored by Sutherland and Belk, a family owned injury law firm if you or a loved one has been hurt in an accident, give Taylor or Russell a call, 615-846-6200. See what your rights are and if they can help. Mailbag also presented by John Levin and the Mater Nexus Government Contracts Group, which advises government contractors on all aspects of their needs with a proud focus on matching legal solutions to business needs. Thank you for both those companies for their help with the, the mailbag and our podcast. And with that, Billy, I'll let you get us rolling here. Steve E79 kicks it off for us early this morning. Mutually parting with Coach Jerry Stackhouse reportedly cost Vanderbilt a number with eight figures. Where is that money coming from? Uh, what would it otherwise have been spent on? It's a good question. Um, you know, Chris, you're probably the best one to answer this. I, I mean, the money, you would guess, I, I don't know. I don't even know where to go with that. <laughs> <laughs> I I have an educated guess based on some things that I probably need to keep to myself. Um, yeah. Joey? <laughs> no educated guess, Billy. My educated <laughs> I don't even, guess is what I, Chris Lee tells me. Yeah. I, I I, I'm just going to say, if, if you got $27 million lying around um, just to, to throw at people, I'd, I'm going to make myself available for that. Yeah, I think Chris, the second part though. What's that? <laughs> can I get that type of buyout from you? Hey, buddy, we we got we get that kind of, but we can do a lot of stuff on the podcast with twenty seven million dollars. I think I think we could as well. <laughs> <laughs> the second part though, what would it have otherwise been spent on? I think is interesting. Um, um nil into this, maybe. I mean, obviously, they would have rather spent it on something else. <laughs> yeah, I think so. That that's always hard to say. It's it's not yeah. like, especially at an SEC school. Yeah, I mean, like if if our air conditioner goes out today 
and and we have to write a large check to replace that. Like, and you say where, what what doesn't get purchased? I don't know. Maybe a maybe a summer vacation or something like that. Uh, you just Vanderbilt's got a ton of money. Uh, yeah. That's that's one thing, but I don't know. That's <laughs> that one might leave a little bit of a mark. Yeah. Okay, Smashville. Can you elaborate on your reports that Byington is working incredibly hard? Is this from a recruiting standpoint, assembling a staff, booster outreach? I assume it is all the above, but would love to hear more. Yeah, I mean, it's it's all the above. And I think we talked about it uh, early in the podcast. You know, you he's doing everything so far. He's saying everything so far that I think fans and, and you guys want. You know, like, let's go back two, two and a half weeks ago, but before Byington was, was hired. I think most fans would agree that you want a guy that's going to come in here and embrace the former players, get the fans back inside Memorial Gym, embrace the students. I mean, he went to a frat and, and hung out with some of those guys, and, and he said, I'm going to get this thing going, I promise. You know, I mean, you hadn't seen that, but I don't think Bryce Drew did that. I doubt Kevin Stallings no. did that. Um, this is something we haven't seen uh, in a long, long time. And so doing that, I mean, it's got to excite fans. And I think just optically, the, 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 he's, he's doing everything you want. The booster outreach, I know that's happening. Assembling a staff. Um, you know, we've heard good things. I don't know if we've, we've really put this out there. I think we put this on the board. Um, but keep an eye on VMI's head coach, you know, to, again, we don't, that's, that's just something we've heard. Um, you know, you would guess there's a lot of the JMU guys that come over, uh, but again, it's also hard when you, when you talk about assembling a staff and getting players in here, when you don't have any staff connections yet, like we don't, you know, we hope to build those. Yeah. And I think we will with Byington, you know, we, Joey and I got to meet him. He's, he's approachable. He's relatable. He's a nice guy. Um, he's, he does seem like a, a people person. He's got a ton of energy. Um, and so, yeah, I just, I think. He's doing everything and he's saying everything so far before winning and losing that you had to do. And I just think I think fans should be excited about that. I think a lot of what I've heard is on the recruiting end. And I think we we have a nice, diverse kind of database of knowledge here because you guys have a lot about the former players and such. But from what I've heard, the hours that they've put in have surpassed a lot of what has been put in previously with this program already. And I think that's a really good sign. Even if they're not getting great results, I think I think they have semi-close to a fully operating staff. I don't know how close it actually is, but it seems like it's not just buying to making the calls. It's not just GAs making the calls. Like They seem to actually have some things in place. So I think the staff's going to be announced semi-soon. I don't know exactly what it's going to look like. I don't know exactly what their transfer class is going to look like. But from what I've heard, those things tend to be heading, heading in a – pretty solid direction and I don't think that you can really fault them for their recruiting effort at this point if you're looking for something to pick at yeah I I don't think there is any comparison in the effort put into recruiting and development of relationships around the program I I would bet I would not be surprised if he's done more of that in a week than Jerry Stackhouse did in his first six months and it's not it's not hard Guys, it's really, it's really not. You just put in the time, put in the effort. Um, you know, the, those are things you can control. And Byington is doing everything he can control. Um, you know, there's some things that he's not going to be able to control, like early on. You know, this is a good league. So, but, but he's doing everything he can control so far, which I, I think stands out. Um, yeah. Right. Let's see here. Denver door over to football. For football, what is one word you would use to describe the changes you've seen to our offensive players so far this spring practice? Same thing for the defensive players. Um, let's see. I'll start offense. Um, I mean, it's a it's a new quarterback room. That, that, that's that's for one. I, I I do like what I've seen from Drew Dickey. Chris and I talked about this. I think yesterday at practice, he's probably been one of the better practice players, quarterback wise. We you know. Chris has obviously seen it fall at fall camp. And um, again, that may not mean much, but I mean, I think Dickie's doing his, his job and he's, 
the only guy that was retained from the quarterback room, at least, you know, so far. Uh, and I guess one, you know, some of the walk-ons. Um, let's see. I, I think Quincy Skinner is bigger, uh, you know, more physical. He's got to stay healthy. And I think, you know, he's obviously focusing on that and 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 everybody's trying to stay healthy. I mean, Clark Lee talked about that. He's just we've changed the way we train in practice. I mean, totally. And so I think I think that has changed the way players look physically. Uh, Richie Hoskins, you know, a little bit bigger. I think Junior Sherrill, too. Everybody's like everybody's a little bit bigger. Um, and and I, I think that that's noteworthy. Junior Sherrill on field wise, you could say right now, Chris, maybe he's their best offensive threat. Um, I still think Quincy Skinner has has some potential in him. He just hasn't hasn't been able to stay healthy. Um, and then tight end wise, Cole Spence. I, I think I said this on the board. He's a he's a specimen. He's six seven. He can run. I think Cole Spence has a ton of potential. He's got to get back. You know, I, I don't know if he's one hundred percent right now. I would guess he is, but again, it's always tough getting back from that injury. Um, so I think Cole Spence is a guy to watch. Running back wise, I don't think anyone really wows you. And, and I think you touched on this yesterday, Chris. You know, when we had Coach uh, um, Coach Muhammad uh, Langford on, um, you know, yesterday we were able to talk to him, and he talked about the room. It, you know, it's got some depth though. You know, from from one to to four or five, that you know he likes that room. But there's not that that home run guy, you know, where, where you can give it to him, you know, 20 times a game like a Ray Davis. You know, they, they don't have a guy like that. But I think Cedric Alexander and A.J. Newberry, that's a decent, decent little one two punch duo there. So um, offensively and then offensive line. Hard to tell right now, but I do think Grayson Morgan looks really good. He hasn't re hasn't really been practicing much, but, you know, physic physical wise, he looks good. I do think Castillo needs to probably some down a little bit to, to get back to a, a good playing weight uh, because Klanakis is asking these all, a lot from these offensive linemen. you got to move. So, I don't know. It's hard to say right now, but offensively, that's what I would say. Defensively, Dante Carter is an athlete. Brandon Fontenet is an athlete. We know about C.J. Taylor. Langston Patterson's all over the field. Um, this defense has some players. Now, they've, you know, we, we haven't seen Clark Lee's defense yet. And I think that's what that's what's intriguing about it. Uh, what Taha is still still huge. It looks like he's he's even a little bit bigger. I like Zaylen Wood. I uh, got a look at him yesterday. Um, you know, he's not he's not massive, but I think he can he can do some things on that defensive line. Still like Christian James. So, Chris, again, it, it's hard to take away much from these, but I do think body type wise and physical stature wise, there's some there's some differences with with some of these guys. Yeah, I'll give you – I'll start with the good news. I feel like their defense has got more ability than the other ones that Clark Lee has had. No, look, that is not a – that's not a real high bar to clear. Yeah. Uh, and I've only been to one practice so far. I will get to go to more, but I have watched these guys. Obviously, I know the personnel. I mean, I'll, I'll give you a couple things. I'll start on defense. I look at the secondary. I think Taylor and Dante Carter is a is – a, better safety do than it do than it feels like they've had in a while uh colby taylor's been a guy that i think they've seemed to have liked so far he played a lot at wyoming that's a team that typically although it is not power five it is built on defense and so I, billy when you and i went to practice last year i think joey went some too i, I just looked at their corners and i said i don't know how you get stops in this league with that cornerback room uh martel height was clearly their best corner this time a year ago, but we're like, he's a true freshman. He's never played a, a down in this league. Now Heights got another year. Taylor's got some experience. They're, they're better at safety. Um, I, I think everybody likes Langston Patterson. Y you saw what he could do at times last year. Longwell, same guy. You saw some, some flashes of, of what that kid could do. So I, again, there's some, there's some ability there. Prince Collie, if they can get him, healthy and out there a lot. Who knows? That was a kid that was a five-star recruit. Uh, Brandon Fontenet, you touched on him. He's in that playing that star position that's between the linebacker and the, and the defensive backs. Better athleticism. Up, up front, I, th I think the thing that stood out to me, I was trying to put together a depth chart, and you watch their defensive line, and it looks a little bit more like 
major college bodies there. And, and you start looking down, you go, all right, Zalen Wood looks like he can play a little bit athletically. Uh, Corday Snyder, same thing, look a little bit more like major college defense. Those guys are running second and third team. Demarion Thomas, a guy that is, I was kind of slotting a depth chart, might be a third team guy for now. That's a good thing. These are guys that like look like they can play, uh, look a little bit more athletic like SEC guys. You got a guy named like Miles Capers, might be running third or fourth team. Capers was a kid that was starting by default a couple of years ago, I think, or, or slated to. Um, now, look, there, there is not a there's not a surefire NFL guy in there, and I, I do. I, I have some questions about their top end talent, but they got a little bit more depth there, or maybe a lot more than they've had in a while. Um, Iso Tar, a guy that you know you were thinking would be a guy playing a lot, may, maybe running third team because they've just got some better players. Offensively, I'm concerned. Um, I just don't think there's a lot of talent there. I mean, it is clear that they are they are all in on a mobile quarterback strategy. And I think everything's going to flow from there. Good job answering the question in one word, guys. Uh, but <laughs> yeah, I, I think that I, I think we violated the spirit of the, the question there. Sorry about that. But no, um, I think offensively, the good news is that they know what they want to be. Like you said, like I they, totally they, forgot. I've totally <laughs> forgot that was in the question. By the way, holy crap! We'll blame uh, Billy for that. I took his cue. Yeah, you did. Thank <laughs> you. Um, offensively, I think I know they know who they are. I don't think that they have the talent that they had at certain position groups offensively. Um, I think that's the hold up there. The offensive line, I think, maybe is better suited this year to what they want to do than it was last year. I think their quarterbacks know what they want to do. Uh, defensively, I think they're more athletic on the back end especially, and that's kind of the word that comes to mind is athleticism on defense. And I think their energy has been better on the back end as well. Kobe Taylor is a guy who they've mentioned a few times, has brought some good energy to the room. He's been a good competitor for them, but – yeah, I, I just don't know that they're a whole lot better as a whole, but I do think they know what they want to be a little bit more. They want to be athletic on defense. They want to have guys with range and length and athleticism, and then offensively they want to have kind of a speed-driven offense based around the quarterback. Uh, we'll see how it works, but it, at least at the very least they know what they want to be, and I don't think they knew that last year at this time. Boom, you just nailed it there, Joey. Um, okay, pessimistic door. What's the expectation for Clark this year from the Vanderbilt perspective? I would guess administration wise, you know, what what their expectation is is what he's asking. It's apparent he's on a hot seat. I don't even know if that's true, with completely reshaping the program. If he only wins three or four games next year, what do you predict the reaction would be? Okay, we'll start with that first one and we'll kind of go around. Expectation for Clark this year from the Vanderbilt perspective. Just look more competitive. Um, now, win, win column wise, you've got to be better. Yeah, if you go two and ten, who knows? But again, we've talked about it, guys. Who know? Clark could go one and thirteen next year, um, or one and whatever, one and eleven. And do they do they make a move? I mean, I with with, with the money they just spent on that buyout, probably not. I mean, you. We, we've seen this this movie before. And so expectation-wise from Vanderbilt, Chris, I don't know. I mean, is there much much of one? I mean, obviously, they got to be better. But I don't know. That, Look, that's, a, that's a hard question. Expectations at Vanderbilt have just never the, – the bar has never been very high for much of anything as long as I've covered it. If you're going to say he's got to win X amount of games, I mean, I, if he were to win four, that would feel like a minor miracle to me with his schedule. Um, I, I know it's not enough to get people excited if you do that. I, to me, it's got to look like a competent football program. They've got to stay in some games. I think we said we said this the last two years. It, it's not just the wins and losses to me. It's do they look like they belong? Are, are the games over at halftime? Are, are they hanging in there and, and playing Kentucky to the fourth quarter? And I think that we got – and I think they would, would say it too readily. I, I think we got a false sense of where the program was by the ability of winning two games late in, in November that, that they kind of snuck away. I, I don't think that last year didn't go like that. 
to me, I'm watching the Virginia Tech game because that's one that they maybe could win. If they don't win, I don't think all is lost. But if, if they go out there and they, you know, it, it's a it's anybody's game with five minutes left. To me, that's progress. If we're in the middle of third quarter, they're down 21 points, um, and they pick up a garbage time touchdown or too late when it's over, that that's not progress. So to me, it's I'll, I'll give an example. Play Virginia Tech close. Win the Alcorn State game. Win the Georgia State game. You know, be competitive against Missouri, Kentucky, beat Ball State. Uh, be competitive against Auburn and South Carolina. Uh, LSU and Tennessee, good luck. But, I don't know, You you you. if you're competitive in those games that we just named, I think then maybe you got something to bank on. If you're still getting boat raced by some of those teams that maybe aren't top 25, then I think um, you, you have a lot of questions exiting the season. Guys, I just don't buy that he's on the hot seat yet. And with how I don't much, either. With how much teeth pulling they did with Stack in year five, what happens to Clark? I mean, Clark knows how to talk to people. He knows the right people. Those The right people like him. I think that goes a long way over there. And for better or worse, I think he, he is what they want in a football coach. And I think he has a vision that they like. And I think he's doing a really difficult job. And I think they – or receptive to that. So I don't know that I fully buy that. I totally agree with your assessment of success because I don't I don't think they're going to go win six games and get to a bowl game again, or not again, but just generally. But I do think there's a, there's a path to them winning three games and it being a different taste in people's mouths than it was last year to where they – I think they lost every SEC game by 15-plus points, and a lot of those games were done by the start of the fourth quarter. Pretty much all of them were done by the start of the fourth quarter can't happen again, but I just don't fully – we don't have – or at least I don't have a whole lot of intel to back this. I just don't feel like he's on the hot seat yet. Uh, Okay, another second part to that question. Should we expect any more impact transfers in football, or is this pretty much what they're working with? If they're still targeting transfers, what positions would they be trying to fill? I think Dericky Wright is one to look at. Uh, C.J. Taylor put something on his Instagram. Looks like it's tracking that way, I, I would say. Um, other guys, I still think they need an offensive lineman or two. Um, I think they would agree with that assessment. Um, you know, and so <clears throat> you could see some more offensive linemen uh, because they need it. I still think that offensive line is is better, but how much better? So I'd say look out for Derricky Wright and maybe a couple, one or two offensive linemen, I'd say. I don't know if you guys have anything else. Billy, I think they need almost everything. I mean, th- there's there's not a superstar th- that I can find. Now, no, look, I think they have the foundation of some guys that can defend, but that receiver room is not SEC standard. They they need a receiver there. Uh, I I think they. I don't know if one of these younger running backs is the answer. To right now, to me, it looks like they've just got a lot of guys that are guys. I don't know if there's a stud in there anywhere. Um, I think a lot hinges on Diego Pavia, how good he is in this system. I mean, he's played this system before, so maybe how good he is week in and week out in the SEC is another way to put it. And does he have enough guys around him? Th- that offense to me is is worrisome in terms of a, of a talent standpoint. So, I think, Yeah. I think they're going to get and, and by the way, the, the thing I was going to say is Clark Lee did – in his interview yesterday, Billy, at one point he did mention something about maybe the, the portal and, and some needs there. I think receiver to me would be high on the list of things they need. Mm-hmm. They're going to get one more, right, in the in the summer. The Texas Tech yeah. transfer signed, right? Yep. So they'll get one yeah. more. They'll get, a, they'll get a lot of guys that come in in the summer that they don't currently have. I don't think that completely changes your outlook on the roster, though. I agree. I think they need a lot more. How many scholarships are going to be open? I don't know. And what do they do with that? I don't know either. But I do think they need a few more. But I don't know that I'm super optimistic that they're going to bring in a couple more guys that are going to make huge impacts at this point. All right, C Perk 25 what are some way too early bold takes of yours for the football season? I like this one. Uh, bold takes. Diego Pavia 
ends up being quarterback one by the end of the season. And that's a bold take. I'm not saying I firmly believe that will happen. I'm just saying I could see that happening. Pavia knows the offense. I don't know that that's had... very bold. Well, I just, from my you perspective, it... <laughs> from my perspective, it's... Awesome guy. Well, I still I, am. Well, look, and, and that's, it's bold yeah. for me. Yeah, I like I still think Johnson's the guy, but from my in my brain to me, that's still a bold take that Pavia ends up. I guess the more bold take would be Pavia leads Vanderbilt to a bowl. Right? I guess that would be more of a that would be a better bold take. That's very bold. Yeah, it's really bold. <laughs> what about you guys? Hot takes. I mean, I think the defense is going to be better. I look at the talent and depth. It, it just looks to me better than it's been. Um, which again, not a not a super high bar to clear, but you can see some some little pieces starting to form there on that side of the ball. Clark Lee is going to be in charge of it. I think that's a good thing. I th- I think that's. I, I'll I'll throw this out there. I'll say the defense shaves off a, a touchdown off what it gave up a year ago. Uh, that that might be a lot with the schedule, um, but if you want something bold, I I could see that. I think I look at the running back room, and I don't know that they're going to be a great running back room. I think I'm a little higher on AJ Newberry than others are, and I think he fits what they want to do a little bit better than maybe some other guys do. So I guess maybe AJ Newberry is better than we think he is this year. But I don't know. I just I'm not super optimistic about their plans. But I think the path offensively is kind of there to see to where it's a different look than teams are normally getting in the SEC. And I think that's maybe maybe a bold take is that that could work better than maybe we anticipate, especially with A.J. Newberry's speed paired with Nate Johnson. All right, baseball bros, any truth to the Malik Dia to Vanderbilt talk? Um, yes. <laughs> I'll I just say that. I can't guarantee anything, but uh, yes, there is – Definitely. That's not coming from nowhere. I'll say that. Um, any info on potential transfers that Mark Byington might be hosting? I think we put up Tyler Nickel, who started his career at North Carolina, uh, from, you know, transfer and, or entered the portal from Virginia Tech. Jacob Meyer is a guy to watch from Coastal Carolina, who I really like. Uh, lefty can shoot it. Those are the two guys I've seen, Joe. I don't know if you've seen any others. There's some guys that um, have been out there publicly. Let me see if I can find it real quick. Um, but, yeah, those are the main guys I'm kind of looking at. Dia, I think, is a guy I'm really looking at. I think uh, they've got a real chance to bring him back, and I think that would be a nice start to the offseason. Uh, Warwick from Northern Kentucky, Cade Tyson, they've contacted both of those. Um, any others? There's one or two others that they've contacted, but I think Dia, Nickel, and Meyer are probably the guys to watch for now. We'll probably get more of an idea in the coming weeks, depending on how those recruitments shake up. But if they could get Nickel and Dia at the very least, I think that'd be a really nice start to the offseason. Not a not a start to a tournament type team, but a competitive team. Yeah, guys, I got to get going. Uh, Chris, do you have the mailbag pulled up? I think we still have three or four left. I didn't realize how big the mailbag was. Um, yeah. But- um, can we do this without you being around? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, let me, I'll, let me I'll pull switch that this up. up, but I'll see everybody. Um okay. All right, Door fan, when will we see JD Thompson or David Horn pitch again this season? I I forgot to ask about that Sunday. Thompson's supposed to be back for LSU from the okay. sound. Uh okay. Horn, I'm not sure, but what the last time he pitched was what, South Carolina? Um, I wonder if he would have pitched last night had they played, but I don't know. Yeah, I, I wonder that too. Um, okay, let's see. All right, predicted order. This is from Bighorn Sheep. Predicted order of the next sporting event to happen. Vanderbilt baseball making the College World Series. Vanderbilt football makes a bowl. Men's basketball makes the NCAA tournament. Women's basketball makes the Sweet 16. I've got a clear number one here. Um, two through four, a little murkier, Joey. Shoot. You can go first. But my number one is making the World Series. I could see that happening this year. I'm not sure that I could see any of the other happening um, 
next sports season? Yeah, I think that's probably my my path here as well. I think number one is probably baseball. Number two is Sweet 16. I think their infrastructure is really healthy. If Shea can go get a big this offseason, I think they got a real chance. They got a five-star point guard coming in. She had a really good McDonald's All-American game last night. Ayala Morris coming back. Sasha Washington should be back. That's a really solid group that they have coming back. I, don't, I think they've lost some, but they have a lot of the pieces they need. And then if she can make some noise in the portal, I think they've got a chance to really make some noise. I think men's basketball, probably after women's basketball there, um, I tend to believe in the direction they're heading. I don't think they're going to make a tournament this year. I think their roster is still going to be too far away, but yeah. I would say I have more confidence in that than football making a bowl game in the near future. Yeah. Just because of the schedule for football as well. Yeah, agreed. Uh, th that's about it for the mailbag. So with that, we'll end the show today. Um, thank you to you and Billy for being with us. Thank you to our sponsors, Wash House, Northboro Pure Milk Studio, Sutherland and Belk, uh, John Levin and the Maynard Nexus or Levin, excuse me, and the Maynard Nexus Government Contracts Group, and of course Anchor Impact. For Joey Dwyer and Billy Derrick, I'm Chris Lee. Thanks for watching and listening to the Vandy Sports Podcast. <laughs>